You can see why the words of the song have become a, a good praise song for us and fit very well with the topic that we're dealing with today in our, what has ended up as our sermon board, Our Family Will. Our family will comfort one another. The eighth sermon in this section. Well, over the last while, we've looked at several aspects of one another passages. But what's a one another passage? Who's our one another? One another passage were, were written to several congregations in several places, calling those groups to live out their faith among their members. As we read these passages together here in Vernon, I want us to think about how we can apply the principles and teachings of these passages in our local work here. We're part of the work of the kingdom of God in a global sense, and a part of the work in the province. We're one of the congregations serving our city. Each week we choose to come together to serve Christ from this building. So we apply the one another passages among ourselves first, and then into the other layers of connection that we have. What a blessing to have a congregation that loves and accepts, shows that love by praying for each other, telling the truth to one another, being kind to each other, bringing joy and hope to one another, serving one another as we are patient to one another, and as we comfort one another as Christ comforts us. Today we're talking about comforting one another, and what do you think of when you think of comfortable? Some of you are saying, my feet are hot already. <laughs> Abby is saying, bring it on. When you think of comfortable, like 80%, 90% of the commercials you're going to watch this week, it's about something that you're missing that's going to make life better. You're not quite there yet. You need this so that you're better, comfortable. We can use the word to talk about a comfortable chair and a cozy blanket with warm feet of the fire and a warm drink sitting in comfort without the care of the world. And Abby's crying. It's nice to be comfortable like that, isn't it? And we need that kind of rest and relaxation. We need the time to disconnect and make sure that we're okay, that we're energized, and that we're taking that time of rest so that we can be a blessing to others. That Sabbath, that disconnection. But today we're not talking about that kind of comfort, are we? We're talking about another level of of comfort, a kind of comfort where we comfort one another. The challenge here is that this kind of comforting comes to those that aren't doing well. And even a nice chair and a warm blanket won't change things in the long term. We're called to comfort those whose life has brought discomfort. We're called to help those who are struggling with the challenges of a fallen world and the impact of sin and its consequences, even the consequences of other people's sins that have made less, less than life less than ideal. We are called to comfort the lonely, the sad, the hurting, the struggling, the stunned and deflated. And we often do so out of our own experiences by being in those shoes and walking a mile at some point. In the worst of it, in the lowest of times, in the deepest of struggles and the loneliest darkness, we have God, who has been our comfort. Amen. Something that the world is missing. Those that don't have Jesus, they just don't have that comfort. We are called to comfort those whose life has brought discomfort. So when we comfort one another, we share God in practical ways and in intercessory prayer. We need one another. So God calls us to one another and reminds us of the need to watch out for one another, comfort one another as they've tried to comfort us in our own struggles. We learn to comfort others from God. God made the world and the Garden of Eden. That was pretty comfortable, wasn't it? In its origin, the way that it was set up. And then we sinned and Jesus came into this world and took on a ministry of serving and caring for people. He came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19.10, because the spiritual in life is the most significant part of our lives, but it is not disconnected from the physical. 
Jesus also came to serve, Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus shows us the life of compassionate care, not just an eternal destiny, but caring for one another in the here and now. Consider how Jesus cared for the society that he was a part of. He cared for the outcasts. He cared for the sick, when society mainly thought that they were being punished by God, so let their life be miserable because that's what God wants anyways. He cared for lepers. Do you realize that was at risk to himself? His leprosy is contagious. He cared for women and a woman who had been bleeding for years, who was ostracized and separated from her family and society in general, never to get a hug, never to be touched, never to be able to go home until she was cured. He cared for the grieving and returned a son to his mother in Nain. There's one passage that says that Jesus wept. What was he doing when he wept? Why did he cry? He was there with Lazarus had died. And he was there watching others grieve and he grieved with them. Even knowing that he was going to raise him from the dead, the passage says Jesus wept because they were not comfortable, and he wasn't comfortable with that either. He comforted the apostles before the crucifixion. Knowing what he was going to go through, he prays for them. In John 17, and in the garden, as he was arrested, he's praying for them that they would be okay. Even on his way to the cross, he shares the words of comfort to the women that were following him, to his mother, to John, and he says, from the cross, in the pain, in the moment, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Does that sound like a God of comfort and compassion to you? That wasn't just concerned about their eternity. He's concerned about their here and now. How are you doing today? How can I help you through? God is a God of comfort. The Gospel of Matthew makes note of the compassion of Jesus. And it says that word, compassion. And out of his compassion, he did things. Because he, Matthew chapter 9, saw that they were sheep without a shepherd, helpless and harassed. And in compassion, he said, send out workers into the harvest field. In chapter 14, 14, 15, 32, and 20, 34, are all examples. It says, out of his compassion which is a fantastic Greek word, splunknizomai. There, you can use that in a sentence this week. I'll give you a nickel. Out of your guts. Out of your guts. That feeling you get in your gut when somebody's not doing okay and you know it's the right thing to help, that's compassion. You just know, I don't feel right. And they don't feel right. Let's work together shows us the heart of Jesus and his caring nature. Have you taken note of the many times that Jesus has comforted you? Not just a note of the misery that you've been through at life, but how did Jesus provide comfort? How did Jesus help carry you through during the lowest times in your life? How he has provided care and comfort to you in the struggles of life internally through the Holy Spirit and externally through the body of the church? God cares about we are, what we are going through as we seek to be faithful and to serve him and to serve in the kingdom. We've been promised that we will suffer for Jesus and we'll be persecuted. So we know that life is not always easy and that God is not just about making sure that everything is good. That's hedonism, the seeking of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. God says seek faithfulness. You'll be persecuted and life will not be easy, but we have always been promised his comfort. Here's the best part of all. Heavenly comfort. One day, one day we will be with Jesus and we will be comforted completely. Amen. We can get so wrapped up in the day-to-day -day and the misery of this and the pain of that and the struggle of here that we can forget. But God will bring us that heavenly comfort. It will be something that we've never known and that we've always wanted. It's not the goal of our faith. 
it's a reward of it. Heaven will be a place to be with God forever in a body that has no aches and pains. Check. Isn't that going to be different? No aches and pains, no limits, no tiredness, not too hot, not too cold. A place where we feel great. It's also a place for our mind to be at rest. No worries, no shame, no guilt, no wonder, no anxiety, just peace that passes all understanding. And relationally, we'll have no struggle in this area as well. We'll be surrounded by God's love and the love of others. We will not miss those that did not choose salvation, but surrounded by the whole family of God from every nation, tribe, tongue, area, from all time. We will all be together. You will meet brothers and sisters from around the world that you don't know about today. You'll meet some of my friends from Papua New Guinea. We'll meet Bible people and we'll meet future generations if God waits that long. But we will all be together as the family of God. All of this in full perfection forever. So this level of comfort, that sound pretty good to you? But we're not there yet, are we? God calls us to comfort one another. In the here and now, we have work to do. In the here and now, we have work to do as we live this, in this fallen world awaiting our Redeemer. But it's not all that bad because we have good work to do and we have one another. We also have God's Word that guides us and encourages us to do good works. And one of the responsibilities that we have is to comfort one another. And that's just a shade of what will happen in heaven. Our board selected these passages. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 7, Galatians 6, 2, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. That's the order that they put them on the board. I'm not going to do them in that order because the 2 Corinthians passage is so good, I want to save it for last. Let's start with Galatians. Galatians 6, 2. You know me, I like to do a pericope, section of thought. Don't just take the verse out. Let's take a look. Galatians 6, 2 is a part of a 10-verse section, starting in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. So let's read that and notice the points about comfort and comforting one another that are developed in this passage. It says, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted." Then the passage, the one that's mentioned on the board, is verse 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now this passage isn't talking about social care. It's talking about spiritual care. Because somebody's caught in sin, you should help carry their burden. You should help restore their faith. You should, it doesn't, the greater passage would say, care for one another physically as well. But the intent of the passage is about those that are struggling in their faith. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to anybody else. For each one should carry his own load. It's our own responsibility to deal with our own sin and our own sinfulness. That's a primary responsibility of individual faith. We offer to support one another, but you can't carry somebody else's load. You can't take over for their faith. It's their faith. Verse 6. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not, be deceived. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. This is talking about consequence of action. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. To the one who sows to please the spirit, from the spirit he will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. See how that passage can talk about more than just spiritual renewal? Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, here's your qualifiers, as we have opportunity, let us do good to who? 
to all people, especially, where do we start? To those who belong to the family of believers. See how that passage lays itself out about compassionate care, spiritually and even in a broader sense? As we have opportunities, we start with the church, but we care for all people. It's an aspect of the God that we serve. It is how Jesus lives life. It is comforting to know that you do not live your faith alone. You are responsible for it. You don't live it alone. You need others, and they need you. So, one of the reasons they put the passage on the board is a reminder to carry each other's burdens and to do good. Another passage is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 through 17. Well, the passage meant 16 and 17, but we're going to do a little broader context again. Starting at verse 13. But we always ought to thank God for you. Brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through faith and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that we might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. We ought to thank God for one another and stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you. Then we get more the context of compassion. But you see, he brings it up as a prayer. It says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and the God of our Father who loved us by his grace give us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. This prayer is an example of asking God to comfort our fellow believers in intercessory prayer because we know that God is the source of true comfort. And it's comforting to know that others are praying for us as we struggle. Let's continue to commit to intercessory prayer. That's why we have prayer reminders and why we share our needs among one another that we say, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, who loved us, give us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word, so that we are strengthened to be able to follow through and do the good that God has called us to do. Now I said I would save the best for last, and hopefully you see this passage as the best one. If you have your Bibles open to it, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 7, you might notice that you have it underlined or marked up if you're that type of a person. You might notice that you've selected several aspects of this passage because of its significance in the topic that we're looking at today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Now we're going to take this in little bits because there's enough said right there. We're not far into the passage and a lot has been said already. God is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Now pay attention to what he says about that character of God in action. Who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. This is a good one. This is the essence of biblical counseling. God is providing comfort through us as we minister to one another and what a blessing that is. He comforts us in how many of our troubles? In all of them. So that we can comfort people in what type of troubles? In any of theirs. With our own comfort? No, from the comfort that we have received from God. That's what is comforting to people, is their relationship with God. Verse 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ overflow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. Well, in Christ we have both troubles and comfort. For those troubles and enough comfort to share with others, and Paul is speaking from personal experience, and most of us can speak as well. Following Jesus has enough trouble and enough comfort, and the two of them go together. I think Paul can speak of that. Was it difficult for him to follow Jesus? It cost him a lot. But did he have comfort? Did he have hope 
Yes, because of the work of the Spirit. He's talking about the interaction in Corinth, his working in their area and what it's cost him to bring the gospel to them. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. So do you see why I left that passage to the end? He is the God of all comfort. We are connected to and loved by the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our, in all of our troubles. But why does he do that? Why does God bless your life the way that he blesses it? There's a so that. It's not just for you. It's not just that your life is better so that we can comfort one another, starting with the church and then others. So this week, the make me a conduit of your compassion, we look for, we follow up on opportunity to comfort one another. Because it doesn't take long with people to realize that they're going through something. Think back through your life and the truth of 2 Corinthians passage to see how God has shown you compassion and comfort. And that's probably going to be a long list. How has God cared for you? How has God carried you through the tough times? Pray for an open heart and to see who needs some comforting. Just be more heads up out of your own life into the life of others and just notice who's going through what and how they're doing. Take steps to offer the comfort of God to them and the hope that he provides. This is compassion evangelism, where we care for people because we care for people. And if they ask questions about our faith, we can answer that too. But we care for people because it is the right thing to do. Be thankful for the church family and the role that you play in helping others as they help you. What a blessing to have one another. And all it takes is a couple difficulties in life to realize it is such a good thing to have one another. It is much tougher to live it on your own. Meditate about heaven to have the energy to keep pressing on. Realize that no matter what you're going through or somebody else is going through, time is limited. Right now we have two people we know in our congregation that are in palliative care. Their families realize time is limited. It is moment by moment. But they're there to give comfort, and we're there to give them comfort as well. Be thankful to Jesus for the comfort that is waiting and the comfort that he provides along the journey. Isn't that good too? We have the eternal of heaven where everything's going to be fantastic, and along the way, it makes it a lot better to walk with one another. There's something about ministry. Ministry and compassion. One thing is for our family knowing that it is the love and the care of this congregation that provides for us for everything. For everything. That's kind of a unique relationship. So thank you for the care and compassion that you show to our family. But also to one another. It is noticed when we care for one another, is it not? It is noticed by your friends and your neighbors and strangers. It is noticed when the church steps out. And it's the people from your church that help out. It's noticed. It's appreciated. And to God be the glory. He is the God of all comfort. Don't try to comfort one another without it being from God. God provides that comfort. That's the connection that we provide. And we need one another. We serve one another. We love one another. And because we love one another, we're here to comfort you in your troubles.